I'm going to uh, show a uh, documentation of my artwork and just talk about it. And I guess I will answer any question at any time. Let's see what happens. All right. Um, this is my first installation piece that I created, and it sort of um, set me on the path that I seem to be stuck on now for however many years this is. Oh, I didn't put the date. Yeah, I did. 89. So do the math. Uh, um, it was a double uh, projection at a house in Pasadena um, called Bliss and uh, the Santa Monica Museum of Art. And it was um, about splitting the sites into mail. <laughs> at both sites simultaneously across town. Uh, I didn't own any equipment at the time, so this, um, I just called every manufacturer that I could think of and, and found this guy who was willing to loan me four projectors, which was amazing. And, um, so basically, this is the male side. It's exterior. You can think Freud. And this is the female side, interior. And it's funny. I'm um, now supposed to be creating an, uh, a piece for uh, restrooms at a museum same kind of idea maybe, but I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. Uh, this piece was uh, really important to me because it made me realize I could dematerialize architecture with light that has no physicality. So um, it actually made people f uh, feel seasick when they would be in the piece. And I thought, well, that's, that's really kind of great, you know, to have a physical response. And you know, little kids always know that you should mess around. Uh, this was an important piece to my mm, career, I guess, because um, um, the MOCA bought it, and that was very exciting. There's two projections uh, side by side. One's horizontal and one's vertical, and the second vertical screen is also a rear screen. So if somebody walks behind it, they create a shadow and become part of the piece. Of course, um, this is a, a simulation documentation because at the time I bought one of the first digital video cameras and it was dreadful, so I had to make this. I wanted it to, to kind of feel like you're underwater, you know, but in a star field. Let's see. Uh, this little piece was inspired by Aphrom Protum by uh, James Terrell. And my piece is also uh, projected into a corner, but it shifts between one point to point perspective, and it shakes nervously because I guess because uh, of the Terrell reference or something. I don't know. It's like <laughs> sort of, I don't know. It just seemed like it should shake. So it's when you, oh, <laughs> a really old one, it's like, 100 lumens. I mean, it's way back back in the day. I mean, you can see it. It was my first projector. I, I actually bought two of those. So if you project in the corner, you can get a sculptural or three-dimensional kind of effect. And it was um, it's nice if you project small, especially way back when you could have a lit room. Which, and if you project with white, of course, it's brighter. Uh, this is a collage. It was collaged on the um, on the window of the building and then throughout the space um, on the side. So this is two projections here, the side and the f face. So the soundtrack is just the street noise, which went really well with the piece. So um, each of the strips is collaged together. So I made them each individually and then put them together. So it's a collage within a collage, I guess. In a funny way, I as much as I could, it's more like I push them around with the mouse. So it, it yeah, it was, I got a lot of comments about how painterly this piece was. And, you know, at the time, I was certainly not a, I'm still not a painter. And it just seemed like a really strange comment. Kind of appreciate it actually.
I think it's because of the sort of hand pushed quality of these these wave things. So there's these deformers pushing a shape. And uh, at, at that time I was placing the projectors low so you would cast shadows and disrupt the illusion of the projection. So that's creating sort of a, <coughs> a space in between um, the real, whatever, the, and, and the virtual, which is the computer space. And so creating this sort of experiential, I'll say space, in between the real and the virtual. Uh, this piece was my favorite piece for a long time. There's a projector down here. Can you come out? Yeah, you can. Down here, uh, hitting this wall, and then there's another projector on this lower band hitting this wall. And, so and the animations tilt a little bit, so it feels like the wall is moving. So like the, the background one tilts horizontally, and then these front strips um, tilt vertically. You probably see that. And I call this the TV room because um, uh, my parents' house, the room with the TV, was called the TV room. And just seemed funny, and was, this is also uh, kind of suggesting the scan lines on a television. You know, you know, pretty distant way, I suppose. But it's been interlacing the video in spatially. It was back when I wore dresses. <laughs> This is a uh, first interactive piece. There's sensors inside of the room. And so oh, it would be nice to have one down this hall. So uh, when you pass by, you change the colors. You pause it to go turbulent. You pause it to stop. And if you stare at it, you might s um, s uh, see this uh, uh, motion after effect, the waterfall effect, where uh, if, if something moving stops, it, feels it will go the opposite direction. So I suspended a, <laughs> uh, a rear screen that was 50-50, so it would look good from both sides, because generally rear screens only look good from one side. So it's actually equally bad from both sides. So that is, yeah, that's probably enough of that. Um, this was an exhibition uh, where the artists were invo invited to make um, pieces about passing through. Um, and it was all, all the artists made installations, so that was really overwhelming for the museum, but interesting. So I had them build crisscrossing corridors in the middle of a squared space with rounded balls and red lights. And um, the sort of funny thing about this piece, it, it makes men sort of fearful, curious. <laughs> I guess it's kind of vaginal. <laughs> I don't know. You might have to list that out on the tape because it's vaginal. <laughs> this is Andrew is not afraid. He made the soundtrack. It's also playing with the moray effect. Uh, at the time, it was the largest video display in the world, and uh, it's in Las Vegas. It's like 90 feet high and um, 10, well, no, four blocks long, but it takes about 10 minutes to uh, walk down the whole thing. It's really huge. And um, it's in, in, I guess I, I entered sort of a contest and um, had to convince casino owners that this was a good idea, that to create abstract animation for Las Vegas made sense. So I gave them sort of a, a history of abstraction with um, like Fantasia. There's actually, if you saw Erwin Revel's talk, he showed that um, this last week. Oh, not, oh no, sorry, that was 2001. <laughs> At any rate, I gave him this his, so it included 2001 and included Fantasia, and uh, they, they believed me, and here it is. Yes, yes. In fact, um, 
Jimmy Johnson who created the soundtrack. We we went to Vegas together and we just tried out different so different types of sound and the, this just seemed to fill the space really nicely. I mean, they have an incredible sound system that's kind of amazing. That's such an open air environment would have a uh, sound that really fills. So I'm going to skip ahead a little. This is five minutes. So it's curious to make uh, uh, work for this because of the curve. Some some shapes would work really well, and other shapes would completely die on the curve. I'll just go to the end. Yeah. A no, it's just a canopy that covers the entire block. Oh. It's Fremont Street experience. So every hour they play something else, and so sometimes they play mine. time it was made out of light bulbs, so every time I'd go there and do a test, it would cost them $700 in electricity. Now it's LED, so I guess it doesn't cost as much, but it's crazy. I mean, Vegas money, though, is just whatever. It's not real. No, no, it's, it's LEDs. They upgrade. Actually, originally it was light bulbs. Our red, green, blue light bulbs mounted in the ceiling. They're, they're like slats, so you can actually see the sky through during the day. And then um, they switched it over to LEDs. So when they did that, I had to upgrade my piece, too, to a higher resolution. <laughs> oh, like, I remember that. Hmm? It's really long and thin, like this. Uh, maybe, yeah, it's probably 3,000 pixels by, you know, a couple hundred or something. LED is not that high resolution, but it was certainly higher than the, the light bulbs. And at the same time, I was um, invited to create a piece for the Corcoran, which actually now they're probably going to move out of their building, so I don't know what happens to the piece. It's, you know, maybe I'll take it back, because I actually gave it to them. Because I, you know, I wanted them to have, because I've made it for the space. So it's... Um, uh, six pro this is projectors. Six projectors, and if you're in the middle, you get hit by all six. So that's why she's really bright. And you get a, a lot of shadows, different scale, which was nice. And um, if you pass through one image, you disappear, and then you reappear into the next. So it's kind of a nice you know, multiplying of shadows that happens. And this is... There's a lot of rotundas in Washington, D.C., and so this is like... I don't know why you're supposed to have all these things. And Jimmy made this soundtrack. His grandparents live in the area, so I think he made this very sentimental sounding soundtrack. Okay. Uh, this is at Rice University. And, uh, hmm. It's, it's a, a hallway that, you know, go to the next one, hallway that goes, that students use to go between classes and things. And uh, I built these walls in here, placed sensors down the hall, so as students walk through, they're actually shifting perspective. Right now, I think it's, there's, there's also a sensor in the tunnel, and it, so it'll, oh, God, we say this out of sequence, sorry, I'm gonna shut up. So she's kind of close to the screen inside. I saw her at the opening, and she looked so beautiful in her, sh you know, her shadow. So I asked her to be my model. So there's somebody who's in the tunnel. Somebody needs to re-edit this <laughs> someday. So he's causing it to shift perspective as he walks by, and we use sound cues to kind of help you understand that you're triggering sensors. So it's, it's uh, using a QuickTime VR interacting with it, if you want to know, which is, okay. Um, well, let's see. This is called Jimmy Carter, and it's the first piece I made using plants, and I actually thought about them more as stripes. As you can see, they're pretty stripey. Because I, I 
generally, generally worked more abstract up until this point. And uh, I created this uh, because of 9-11 and because we attacked Afghanistan and I thought it was peculiar that actually we were attacked by Saudi Arabia, but whatever. And I, I'm a pacifist, so this is my anti-war statement. Jimmy Carter is the only president who is, um, is not a warmonger. So this is my little statement. That's my dog, Kadi. She's in he dog heaven. Mm. Oh, that's a, it's sort of hard to explain that one. It's sort of a lot of trouble to work with sound, but I don't know if that's the reason necessarily. I, uh, maybe it, I, it could be like the work becomes more literal and has this uh, story perhaps connected to it. And I don't know, yeah. Because there is some sound, yeah. That's a pretty much the breaking point, yeah. But there's a little. Mm, you'll have to see. Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, dr I'll just say drug addiction gets mixed into it. <laughs> so working with composers who, yeah, so the level of, of like uh, extreme like difficulty, yeah, you don't want to know too much. That was enough. Okay, this is at Caltech. Uh, there's sensors in the ceiling. Is, so it's pretty much art made for scientists. So as they walk through, they cause explosions because that's what scientists do. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, well, it, it, this is a, um, a piece kind of protesting um, the funding of science. We have well over 50%, especially at a place like Caltech or even UCLA, although it depends on how you break up UCLA to think about it. Um, uh, the f a lot of the funding come for the sciences comes from the war machine, and Einstein and myself uh, consider that a huge conflict of interest and a horrible thing, and so I made this piece about that. So I'm triggering sensors and causing explosions. So it's, it's on both sides, and uh, it's, Technically, it's interesting that uh, I could use a pretty low lumen projector because the ceiling was so dark, so it, it kept that area dark. Okay, and then this piece kind of changed everything for me, maybe because I was dared to work with Medusa. There's, it's in, in um, a cistern in Istanbul. It's made out of uh, found parts from Greek and Roman ruins, and some of the parts were these two Medusa heads uh, holding these columns. And uh, they placed one upside down, it, probably to take away her power, you know, because um, basically if men look, look into her eyes, they turn into stone, which that also seems Freudian to me, but <laughs> who knows? So I decided to create this enchanted environment uh, with trees where the branches move like the snakes in her, in her hair. So this one is kind of like a, a tree that was dead that came to life. And within two months after that, I was invited to create a piece for a gallery in New York. So they gave me two months, really, to make this. So I had seen a dervish performance in um, Turkey, and I, I thought, well, um, maybe I can make trees that are trying to whirl like dervishes and you know, trying to have a spiritual experience. And um, trees are a bit limited because you know, they can't really spin around. I mean, that's my rule, I guess. But they do, um, so they, they do go through a cycle, though. They go through the, the four seasons. And then uh, this piece, um, oh, I'll display it. This, um, I'd made a piece called They Eat Their Wounded, and my mom, she noticed the title, and she said, oh, is that about your Uncle Ernest, your great Uncle Ernest? 
who was cannibalized. And I said, um, what? You've never told me about this. And she said, yeah, there's a book. So I got the book, and I read it, and he actually wasn't cannibalized. But he was on a ship during World War I that uh, was built way too fast. It was carrying ammunition and gasoline. It was struck by lightning. And so everybody had to get off very quickly. And he was on a lifeboat with too many sailors. And after 13 days, he drank seawater because he was so dehydrated. And he went crazy. So you know, you're not supposed to drink seawater. And he imagined a nail was in his head and whatever. And so they actually used his body for, for fuel. They created a condenser to, to convert you know, the tiniest amount of seawater into uh, water, uh, like by uh, evaporation. So anyways, this is from his two points of view, one in the water and one I put him in heaven. Not, yeah. He was only 19 and it was really. Um, and this piece I, I had uh, about two months, uh, why is it always two months? Two months to uh, learn how to make a panorama and stitch four images seamlessly together that was, that was fun. I did it. It really pushed my programming skills, which I guess that's a good thing. And then this guy uh, is a series of uh, animations based on the story of Rapunzel. And I consider this a self-portrait. Originally, um, when I created this piece, I was trying to make hair, or, and uh, like, no because it's sort of self-portrait-like. And um, it, in the software I use, is called Maya. It lets you connect the, the plants or flowers to the hair, even though they're s separate things. And so I just did that. And then, and then I happened across the story of Rapunzel. And um, in the beginning of the story, uh, Rapunzel's mother is pregnant with Rapunzel, and she has you know, cravings like you do when you're pregnant for this flower called rampion, which that's what her name comes from. And it was growing in her neighbor's yard, which her neighbor was a witch. Now, actually, my neighbor was a witch as well. And it just occurred to me, yeah, that's, I mean, I just, she just passed away, actually. So it's just funny, right? So this really is a self-portrait. It's bizarre. So anyways, um, except my mom didn't give me away to a witch, <laughs> although... <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's hard to believe, but, uh, <laughs> but um, in, in the story, though, so the, the, the parents basically give up their child to an addiction, and that is what my parents did with alcohol, so I, I consider it a, the, a self-portrait about that. These flowers are not rampant, they're poppies, but I've decided to use poppies as well. And then uh, this guy was uh, commissioned for the Denver Art Museum, and it was uh, built by Daniel Liebskin, and all, most, most of the walls are slanted, and mine was slanted 45 degrees. So they asked me to make a piece uh, that would work with this wall. And so I came up with different ideas, and for some reason they ran some of the ideas by Daniel Liebskin, and he turned them down. And th I mean, that's just amazing to me that the architect can say what the artist is doing in, you know, for their piece. So. Um, that actually worked out fine because I think I created a better piece because uh, somehow adversity sometimes works for me or something. But uh, so this is a, a panorama, uh, three images stitched together in really crazy angled projectors. You, you really don't want to try that yourself. And um, the the idea of the piece it, it's I was actually born in in Denver, in the Rocky Mountains, and so it's a Virtual cloth revealing a rocky surface. That's the idea. Okay, and this is a, another commission. This is in Dallas, Texas, and uh, I'll just pull it. And uh, it's this crazy building that has panels that move. And so I got to, I got to choreograph the panels. And uh, since I was one of the first people to work on it, um, they kept giving me new information. Like the original speed they they just they had set was way too fast, and it shook the whole building. So 
that was no good, right? And then, um, then I guess the CEO of this complex got into a huge fight with the, with the stadium that's right next door. And so they, they wouldn't let them put the speakers up where they originally intended. So they had mounted them on the building. And then the whole building became like a giant speaker, a res, you know. And what, what that caused was all the tenants inside the building could hear the sound better than you could outside. So that wasn't good. So it was kind of like, why did you ask me to work with sound on this? It was like, but anyways, um, so the, the, I, what I did was I uh, worked with an arboretum in Dallas and kind of looked at the flowers that they plant and made a, a piece about that. I also asked, is it, oh, I'll ask you, is anybody from Texas? Yes, ma'am. And what flowers do you think of? Just off the top of your head. That's all right. It's always the same. No. Oh, God, you're the first person to know. No, Indian paintbrushes and um, blue, blue bonnets. That's what you're supposed to say. So maybe you're not from, right? That should have been like, and then here's the section with, oh, it's coming up with blue bonnets. So I guess there's fields of these the blue bonnets and Indian paintbrushes. All right, so you got, all right. Oh, I should take this one out because Mike Kelly just um, passed away recently, so it's kind of sad. But uh, I'm, I've been making pieces in honor of my teachers, so you guys should do that, right? <laughs> Since some of you are my students. <laughs> well, no, maybe it's a dumb idea, perhaps. But I had made um, a piece for my first grade teacher, Miss Zanarell, because she told me I made the best trees in class, so in kindergarten, or no, first grade. And so I made her a piece, a tree. And then um, Mike Kelly, um, well-known contemporary artist, he was my teacher, so I made him a, um, some trees as well. And now I'm making Judy Crook, who she's my favorite color teacher. She's also passed away. Now, Mr. Nerald is still alive, so that's not that you need. There's going to be a quiz after that. <laughs> it's like, why? OK. Uh, this was at the Getty. Uh, they had an Oculus which um, an oculus um, in architecture generally faces north for some reason, and I think it's an, well, it mean, in Latin it means eye, so you kind of presume it's an eye of God, although I kind of Googled that and didn't come up with any answers. Isn't that weird? Because everything's on Google. But, but anyways, I was at the, uh, in Rome at the Pantheon, and they have a very famous oculus there, and it, it was raining, and it, it looked like an eye, an eye crying, and that just, oh, that memory kind of stuck with me. So when I was working on this, I decided to make um, this eye that's made out of pyroclastic, pyroclastic flow, which is basically the really hot steam that comes off of a mud and steam that comes out of a volcano. And the, I'll try to shorten the story of it, but the, the Getty, the Getty Villa is actually a recreation of the Villa de Papri, which was covered over uh, with pyroclastic flow uh, when Vesuvius went. So it just seemed to make sense, this thing about time and space and God. And why is that head in there? It's, oops. Oh, it, well, it's this like cylinder up in the ceiling. And I put the projectors down low and crisscrossed up. And uh, then I, and I, and I uh, have a masking program that I've written so I can cut around. So actually the image bleeds off here, but you don't see it, of course. It's the magic. Yeah, I c yeah. I'm actually gonna be doing a similar thing in a dome ceiling coming up in Minneapolis. Oh, this is another body part of God. So the last one was a left eye, and this is a left clavicle. So plan on putting God body, body parts around. Uh, this is uh, poisonous flowers. Um, I've made so many flowers, I started putting them into a database and categorizing them. There's, I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, so poisonous, wedding, uh, I don't know, witches flowers. There's all kinds of categories you can, you can come up with. And so just to keep track for myself, and poisonous kept coming up, so I decided to make this piece this kind of waterfall of 
of uh, flowers. And then uh, this piece, I, I actually, um, it was originally a commission for the Ronald Reagan Hospital here in Westwood, and I just put it up this weekend. And um, so this is one of the studies for it, which is at a collector's house. So the, this is a still from the, off my iPhone, so it's, it's not too great, got to work on it. Um, and I have to get some video of this. But um, basically, uh, when Ron, I did a medical history of, I looked at Ronald Reagan's med medical history, and when he was pretty young, um, they, somebody realized that he needed glasses, so they got him some, you know, they got him some glasses, and he realized that butterflies existed. And I thought that was, you know, such a funny way to portray uh, Ronald Reagan. And it, actually, a way you could do it without um, without insulting maybe Nancy Reagan, and it's still making you know my point. So it's a it's a way to make a political statement that doesn't offend. <laughs> Which you know that's a real trick if you ever <laughs> try to do that. It doesn't always work out, but it, in this case it did. Because I mean, really, Ronald Reagan is to me. Is, I mean, I listened to his speeches, and he he could convince anybody to do anything. He, I mean, he, he could be hitting you with a hammer and saying, this feels good, right? And you'd be, oh. I mean, just, just the way he, I mean, he's so smooth. It's incredible. So, and he, he actually um, wasn't good for hospital, I mean, for the medical profession. So, I mean, I was talking to my doctor about it, and she said, yeah, it is kind of ironic that they named the hospital after him. So, curious. But uh, that's how it is. Uh, this is an interactive piece. There's a, a museum across the street from this display, and they have a pretty extensive uh, children's program. So I thought that maybe they could, um, as kids make things, they could scan them, um, maybe with a, a camera or a scanner or whatever, and then they immediately show up on the LED s uh, screen you know, across the street as falling you know, artworks. This is actually my niece, my niece's work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John Houck actually collaborated with me on that aspect of it. So he, so the the minute, um, oh, this part's funny. Let me. Oh, sorry. Um, so the the minute it's scanned, it shows up in a folder, and then it gets called up into the program. So it's using Director, and the Director's just you know look constantly looking to update the maps. And then uh, the the clients are like. I think, bank, yeah, it's a bank. And they, they, they figured out that, well, maybe having children's drawings is, is not an art piece. So they asked me to make a version with my art, which, you know, I, I guess I could have fought that, but it's, you know, I, you know, I doubt they'll even ever play this part. But So this is with my drawings, and the other part is with, you know, arbitrary kids' drawings. But it, it, it defaults to just playing this one, so. It's funny, you know, f with digital art, there's, there's always new rules and new boundaries and, you know, things you have to think about that, you know, generally, yeah, f you don't it, with any other medium. So, uh, Up to this point, all the work had been done in the computer, and uh, so nothing from reality, but I decided to break that rule and make drawings and then uh, manipulate them. So these are all Sharpie drawings that are laid on top of each other. And I made several variations. I always make a lot of variations because I, I never know exactly what it's going to look like in the real space. And so I, I like to have you know, some choices. And, uh, this guy is Orbit, and it's kind of, um, kind of like a, a planet that uh, orbits within three and a half minutes. And so the seasons change in about three and a half minutes. And so this is projected um, as an installation. Usually it's um, probably more like this, on a single wall or like this, or it's even on a monitor. It, yeah, this is at Acme. Yep, yep, a few years ago.
So I made lots of layers and then combined them together. To me, it's, it's, I, it, it makes me think of Jackson Pollock or something a little bit, but with moving trees. <laughs> He's probably a huge influence for me. I mean, he can just make paintings that move without even having them move, which is you know, amazing. Yes, it's been around. <laughs> After Effects. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a commission in Ho at, uh, at Hollywood and Vine. Um, it's on the Walk of Fame. So there's stars along there. And on my section, one of the stars was um, Orson Welles. So his, of course, his most famous film is Citizen Kane. So I decided, and Citizen Kane is basically about finding rosebud, a flower. And so I decided to look at the movie and find all the flowers in the movie and then recreate the movie, uh, you know, a sort of version of the movie with all the flowers that appear in the movie. And then I did the same thing with um, some of the other stars along the street. Um, to list them here. Uh, well, this one, this one's probably My Fair, La My Fair Lady uh, with, Audrey, with yeah, Audrey Hepburn. So she plays a flower girl in the movie. There's a lot of flowers in that movie. So basically, uh, why, why is, hmm. well anyways, we, uh, we just went through and looked at hundreds of movies and determined which movies uh, were a little bit more about flowers or flowers had something to do with the plot and then tried to figure out what those flowers were. And so the, in a, uh, a way, that, oops, go the right way. This becomes more of a dedication to the set dressers and the uh, art directors of the films rather than the than you know everybody else is curious oops now I'm going the wrong way okay okay and then I, I had to go back to my abstraction a little bit I also was um, I guess thinking about death <laughs> so I made this piece that's um, and it and there's this uh, paint effects brush that looks like meat and it's just uh, just really funny to use it. So I decided to finally make a piece with it. So this is in New York. There's, there's like lots of very, this one right here is my favorite one. Let's see. Because it comes kind of like a sculpture. I didn't shoot this. <laughs> usually, I shoot the. You know, usually I'm the one shooting these, so it's peculiar to use this actually. But hmm, I never thought of it that way. I think it's it's more like we're just like you know, we're meat. I mean, it's I, that I, simple, I and you know. Yeah. So, now since I haven't really died, I don't know. It can, hmm. It's funny the study cam makes you think of that. Now it's just it's sort of undulating, and it, I, I want this is probably a good shot because it's it's more meat-like perhaps. So it's like pulling back from meatness, you know, a little bit for some reason. Oh, there's another. Don't need to see that one, but that, this one was at Acme. Okay, and then this guy was in, um, it's actually a girl, <laughs> in San Diego, they invited me to make a piece uh, for their giant space, which used to be a baggage terminal for the train station. And it's really kind of an amazing gigant gigantic space and well anyways the I had to come up with an idea for this and every time I drive to San Diego you, you know you, you go by the the nuclear plant and it's it's just frightening and now that it's shut down and they're thinking about turning it back on and and Fukushima and everything else I mean it's just it's so scary to me so I I wanted to maybe create a giant nuclear blast or something and of course the the museum director was a little bit afraid of that idea and but it was 
kind of like, you know, it, it, when it happens, er, the wind just gets so fast and everything is blowing by, so, you know, like 60 miles an hour or so, just everything <laughs> moving. I thought that'd be really, I mean, I'll probably still do that someday. But uh, as I was kind of researching uh, nuclear weapons in relation to nuclear power, and this kept coming across uh, Madame Curie, who um, discovered two elements, radium and polonium. And she also was the first woman to w uh, win the Nobel Prize, and her daughter was the second. And she's just this m amazing, dedicated scientist, and uh, also very famous, actually. And um, so I, I wa really wanted to make a piece for her. And so I read um, a couple of her biographies, and one was written by her other daughter, who didn't win a prize. Um, and throughout the book, it, it mentions flowers. Um, Marie Curie is like um, really obsessed with flowers, even when she was um, a starving student, she would buy cut flowers. And oh, she oversaw the gardens in her various institutes. And um, it's just, it, there's flowers mentioned throughout the book, and I'm probably the only person who would even pick up on that, you know? So, <laughs> so I decided to make this dedication to her as, uh, as flowers kind of traversing this giant. So they would take about over five minutes to kind of go down this, uh, how big is that? Like, oh, I should put the size, huh? 80 feet. Oh, you have to believe me, 80 feet long. All right. And then in a similar time, I was asked to do a benefit for AIDS, and it was at CAA in, and there's Noah, <laughs> at CAA in um, Hollywood, where um, uh, act, mostly actors are represented, you know, it's, it's where their representation you know, kind of happens. And so it, it just seemed appropriate to make um, some jewelry for the building. And then um, this was for Prospect New Orleans, which is a sort of biennial um, that was created to help uh, uh, New Orleans after Katrina. And so this was the second show. And they, um, so they just invited us out there and we had to pick a spot. And I just, I saw this sort of portal. It's just a wall. So this is a front projection. And um, originally there was a Rodin sculpture standing in front, kind of like, and uh, it's his first public sculpture. And he got a lot of ridicule because it was so well done. They didn't think he actually sculpted it. And so drove him a little crazy, and so he originally called it the Le Vanquis, which means the vanquished, and then he changed the name to the Age of Bronze, probably be, be, because of the um, controversy. And uh, so I decided to have the Rodin vanquished <laughs> to another part of the museum, and I created a, a piece, which in, I'm, I need to actually make more of a close-up for you, but um, it's a looking down on a tree, so it's, Another piece from the perspective of heaven. I don't know. Oh, I keep doing that. It's kind of redundant, right? So it's looking down on a tree that's changing seasons. And then um, I was invited to the fabric workshop to make a piece. And the woman who runs it, her name is Kippy Stroud. And uh, I was at a party where she killed a little white moth with her hand. And I said, Kippy, why did you do that? And she said, because they eat cloth. And that, that sort of, I don't know why that stuck with me, but I was trying to think of, well, what can I do for the fabric workshops? And so I decided to make cloth that was ravaged by moths, especially this one little moth. And um, here's panspermia. <laughs> if you were wondering when I was going to talk about that. Um, oh boy, let's see. I was uh, watching a Stephen Hawking uh, video explaining well all, all kinds of things about cosmology and maybe how, earth, how life on Earth came to be. And he described panspermia, where um, an asteroid that's frozen breaks through uh, the atmosphere and then uh, thaws out and seems to have microbes or something that um, start life. And so he sp uh, speculates that maybe that's how we came to be um, through all these random events that finally, you know, led to this. And to me, to me that's kind of, it's, 
it, it sounds like there's something missing. So I decided to make creationist asteroids. So it's still panspermia, but they, they're asteroids with paintings and drawings. So it's, it's, they're like intelligent asteroids. So this is, you're now in my church. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But <clears throat> yeah, I'll show you a close up. So they're just kind of floating around and bumping into each other. So, so I have an opportunity to, to put one up in a dome ceiling in Minneapolis, and that'll be fun. OK, Ooh, that's it. Whew. All right, thank you. Um, if, if there's any questions, I guess, or not. Oh, sure. No, that was a totally magical experience. I mean, it's crazy because there's water everywhere and it's raining in the ceiling and we're installing projectors and I mean, it was just nuts, but it worked out and it was like, I mean, I had no way of measuring. Usually I measure, take extensive measurements of the space and but there was. Oh, it's the same. Oh, good, oh, good. <laughs> I know, I've never seen how they, I've seen photographs, but I've never been back to see how they, so it's, oh good. Yeah, no, I'm so glad they bought that. That's great. Yeah. Maroon. Mm-hmm, it's because I'm a girl. <laughs> Well, um, my grandmother is a, a flower fanatic. She even had a, the spider chrysanthemum named after her, so I'm making a piece about it called uh, Mrs. Hugh Hedinger. Because it's, it's so weird to name yourself after a man, right? But that's how, you know, that's the name of the flower. So, And um, my mother is, is a crazy gardener. The, every year, um, the news does a flyover of her, of her yard because the whole yard's inundated in tulips. And I'm not a crazy gardener, but I seem to be, seem to, there seems to be a gene or something. So I don't know. It's, uh, flowers have um, all this meaning. And I mean, in, in Victorian time, it was a way of communicating different ideas. There's a, a whole language behind flowers. I know it's just kind of fascinating. And they're so beautiful. And they, you know, when, when the wind blows them or whatever, or it's, you know, the motion is so great. I know, it's kind of hard to resist. Yeah. How do you like doing color at your <laughs> Is that because your color students are here? Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me see. I, you've seen me, I don't know. I spend hours, like, that's the last piece I picked colors for. Um, let me see. It just takes hours of choosing. I, um, I don't even know. It might depend on the concept or something. Or, I don't know, let's go back to the... Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I paint the petals in Photoshop and the, and the leaves and the, uh, the bark, I guess, or stems, whatever. No. They surprise me because I've seen the coloring. I know, it's kind of, I know you can face. see. Um, well, at first, like the, in the beginning, the color had to be very saturated because the projectors were so dim. So it really had to push it. So like these pieces. Um, but then, um, that wasn't so true anymore, so I could, you know, have a little bit more to work with, perhaps. But I, I do like color in general, and hmm. There's no, there's, you know, there was uh, one piece when I was teaching the color class uh, that is not on here, but I mean, I probably can't do internet. Um, and that was, I basically did pointillism with flowers to create uh, different, so using all colors to create a feeling of one color using flowers. But um, I, I don't know, I was, 
I felt like that the color theory interrupted my piece. So this is actually not, it's not so good to tell your students this maybe, but it's sort of something you have to learn and then you have to let go of it. Because it, it shouldn't become the primary focus of your work, I don't, th at least for me. Uh, to me that's not interesting. But it, it's, it's certainly an important aspect and it should be there in the background. And, it, and you should, I mean for me, I, I have to work very hard to get colors I like and you just keep this trial and error and, you know. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, like this piece, we had to get the billboard laws changed, and the the um, the owner of the building was really great. He hired a lawyer. They went to many many meetings with the city, and um, got I guess uh, maybe an exemption for our piece because at the time the city was also fighting the billboard companies because they were just popping them up everywhere and you know sort of um, breaking the law so the city had to come up with stricter laws and then at the same time they're like dealing with me making making a piece out of billboard material well well they did thankfully yeah um, my friend Cameron McNall, he, he did a similar thing in the city, he was in Burbank, I think, and they said no. So, it, but you know, it depends on your lawyer, really. It's not, you know, it's nothing to do with the art, certainly. No, it was kind of, I mean, it was tedious, though. You know, just, you know, doing all this research, looking through hundreds of movies, I mean, it's really not cost effective to make this piece at all. And, uh, and then just waiting to see if it's even going to be able to happen or not. Crazy. Was this one for a light so you, you designed it for, for a light No, no, it's it's LED. All right. Oh. There. Yeah. These so are I love when are up close and mm. Yeah. Yeah, there yeah. Well even with projection it's that yeah. way too. It's like needle point or something. Yeah, yeah that's gonna go away someday. I'm making a piece for, I think I'm making a piece for a 4K projector that's, uh, well, it's one of the only, there's only two 4K projectors in LA, so it's cute, so they're really not out there yet. You would think movie theaters would have 4K projectors, so I guess the one at the Westwood Pavilion has it. Yeah, the Westwood Pavilion Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so I was going to make a, a variation of Orbit with 4K, but I, that means I have to re-render the whole thing and then store all those files. Oh, so maybe stupid to do that. What is your relationship uh, with the 4K projector? How did you get that? Oh, it's um, a, a collector um, is purchasing a piece, and uh, and they said, yeah, we have one of the oh, you know two 4K projectors, and then it occurred to me, oh, maybe I should make you know do a variation of the piece for you, just just for me, really. I want to see it, so. But maybe it's dumb. Yes. Well, um, there's uh, generally additions. Uh, this piece is is one of kind. Let's see. These, they're additions of three each one, and then there's an artist proof, which that comes from printing terminology, but it seems to carry through to digital. Um, some museums won't even buy an artist proof, which is strange, because that's actually the last available copy, so you would think that would actually make it more valuable, but like MoMA will not buy artist proofs, for example. But maybe that only applies to uh, prints, though, who knows. Um, Let's see. So what, what, when you buy the piece, you get a computer. It's usually a, a little computer that's a PC, because Macs don't play it as well, play my work as well. Uh, um, you get two, uh, usually DVDs, sometimes Blu-ray ROMs of the piece, and then a certificate that's signed. And then I keep a, a very extensive list of who owns the work, and when they bought it, and how much, and all this. So, um, 
So a couple of them have been lost now, and so the insurance, the um, their insurance, the collector's insurance has had to pay them back for the piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the smaller works, there might be additions of six. You wouldn't, uh, generally you don't want to go higher than that because then you'd kind of devalue the work. It's, it's it, for contemporary artists, it, it's making a, like a, you know, a special, special piece. But maybe it depends. I mean, you guys keep making things for the internet, so that's, you know, totally different. You know, you, you just have to consider, like, uh, how you're dealing with that. And actually, people who put work on the internet that, that can devalue their work that gets sold to collectors. It's a, I've been hearing about that lately. Hmm. Yeah, I, it's, it's kind of up to you how you want, you know, how you want to think. I, I mean, I'm in, my work, it, it's shown through the museum and gallery world, and you know, that's, that's just how I think about it. And so it's, it's, you know, it's more like buying a painting or photograph or something. Yeah. For root. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> they do do whatever they want. Oh God. Yeah, there's uh, I usually I have the scale listed or you know how it's supposed to it you know, I have it fairly well well documented on my website how it's supposed to look, but you know, sometimes they take a piece that's a small flower, because the flowers are generally supposed to be projected the scale of a flower, and they'll make it huge. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that's another artist when they do that. I mean, it's like Diana Theater or something. It's not, you know, it's not my work. So it's, yeah, it's frustrating. What do I do? I tell them not to do that. There's one place that the tree's too little, so I've been um, emailing, you know, I'll, I'll give you another piece that you can show as an exhibition copy that will work better at this scale. And, you know, I haven't heard back. And it's just, you try to be, you know, diplomatic and, you know, uh, rational and. Mm, I never sue anybody. So <laughs> here you go, do whatever you want, right? It's like, no, it's. Um, my piece in Istanbul would never have happened if I had sued, if I could have sued a museum when I, I had a big accident at a museum um, and I decided not to sue them and it was very good. It actually worked out and I got this show in Istanbul and my whole life like shifted because that was actually a magical moment for me was that piece and the transition that it created in my career. So, so yeah, I don't, it's sort of a rule. I don't sue people. I think it, your life works out better if you don't. Also, it takes over your life if you sue. So, no, so, um, yeah. It's just frustrating, though, to have the work projected wrong. It, couple of them. Well, they lo either they lose the certificate or they lose the discs. So you basically have to have both. Uh, you don't have to have the computer. Uh, to me, the computer is just a player. So it's the disc and the, I mean, that's how I've like um, designated it, you know. And the, the projector, that's gonna constantly shift. A lot of artists, you know, say, okay, this is the projector or this is the monitor or whatever, this is what you have to use. And um, I think that's, that's foolish actually. So you, uh, I make, uh, on my discs, I actually render double or more resolution so that the piece can be migrated into you know, whatever formats in the future. So it's, but I, I guess I need to render 4K for everything now, God, or more, double that even. But actually everything is, can be re-rendered anyways. But, and I have done that before. So I, I re-rendered everything from my past at one point. Now I probably have to do it again. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, they, they beg you, they beg me to just, oh, can't you just burn another copy? And I'm like, no. I mean, it's like painting. It was, I guess an artist could make another painting, but um, generally you say no. So just keep that in mind. And always keep your copyright. That's kind of related. Never sign away your copyright. It's yours. 
Yeah. Yeah, um, not too many. Yeah, mostly for um, like uh, to support causes. Like um, did one for. Oh God, now I'm gonna forget. Oh. Well, like presidential campaigns and things. I haven't done anything for Obama, but I was curious. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, sometimes, um, yeah, I'll be invited to like a, a museum or, and they'll um, see. Generally, the curator already has in mind the space to work with, and that they're usually right because they know their space. And so um, they'll say, oh, you know, do this, would you like to do this wall? And then, then I'll measure it and figure out if you can actually, if that will be feasible. And I tell them how much it's going to cost and for the projectors that they have to purchase, if it's projectors. Or if you want to fill that wall with LED, it would cost $1 million. And, you know, if you want to do that, fine. So, yeah, and then kind of work from there. And then the, and then, um, I like to um, research the space or the place and think about you know, um, what kind of works with it. And sometimes it, you know, you get really lucky and there's something interesting like Medusa or you know, other times it's not so interesting, it's just blank walls, but, but you know, there's a, uh, I don't know. It's, so I, I, I really do, I, I like this process of research and then creating the work and somehow it comes to be. And I guess a, as the years pass, I've had more narrative kind of uh, narrative float into the work somehow. It's curious. You seem particularly narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's usually not a beginning, middle, or end. It's usually a continuation. So it's, yeah, it's not about, it's, it's not about a, a payoff or something. Yeah. Although it could be wrong about that, but yeah. All right, maybe that's a good place to, to end without a payoff. Okay, thank you. Thank you.